You've probably seen the headlines or viral claims this week saying that Tylenol causes autism or ADHD. And then you hop online and see some doctors or people saying, of course not, Tylenol is totally safe. But then you decide to do your own research. You Google it and you find, hey, maybe there are some studies suggesting links. So what yeah. is going on? Yeah, all confusing. And you're, how are you supposed to know who or what is correct? Yep. So we actually wanted to do a deep dive into this again for ourselves, mm -hmm. for our family, for some of our loved ones, our patients. And we're actually gonna share that with you today and how this information is changing what we do for our own family. If this is your first time meeting us, I'm Sarah, mom to three, as well as a double board certified OBGYN and fertility specialist. Yes, I'm Kurt. I'm dad of those same three double board certified in pediatrics and pediatric cardiology. And we are the, the Doctors Dr. Bjorkman. We have had many of you reach out to us asking about the recent news on Tylenol in pregnancy and want to start this episode out by saying it's a little complicated. There is no slam dunk study that says Tylenol causes autism, um, but there is some evidence about a possible association. Yeah, so what does that mean? Well, if you've followed us for a while, you know that we like to start with the evidence that exists, call it what is unknown or opinion, and then share what we're doing for our own family. And so that's going to be the same approach we're going to take today. Let's also acknowledge the worry here. Mm -hmm. um, pregnancy is full of decisions, and when the medicine you've been told is the safe one suddenly makes the news for possibly causing autism, that is scary. I've taken Tylenol before in pregnancy. Am I worried about our kids? What do you do if you have a fever while you're pregnant? What does all of this mean? Yeah, and you know, definitely here, we think you deserve the data and the time to understand some of the nuance. And we apologize, this cannot be quick. <laughs> Indeed. And it is really important for you to know that there are absolutely times when you should be considering taking Tylenol during pregnancy because untreated fever, particularly in the first trimester, increases the risk of miscarriage, birth defects, and premature birth. As we start to talk about autism and neurodevelopmental disorders, it is so important for us to share that autism isn't just one thing. It is a descriptive term that is most certainly on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. For some, this term helps describe a unique way of interacting with the world or processing the world around them. But for others, its diagnosis includes severe features such as being nonverbal, having hypersensitivities, or even stimming behavior with self-injury. Autism is a rising concern. In 2006, <clears throat> about one in every 110 children was diagnosed with autism by the age of eight. That number is now one in every 31 children, according to some recent data from the C CDC in April of 2025. But it isn't exactly clear that autism is ex actually on the rise. Yeah, now most of these changing rates have to do with specific diagnostic criteria and an increased level of surveillance. But even with this, I think we can safely say we'd all like to know if there's yeah. something leading to or actually causing rates of autism and ADHD. Could it be something with our lifestyles? Is it something in the water, in the air, in our food, in our medicines? Is there an association of Tylenol with ADHD and autism use? Is this real? So as we dive into the data, it is important to remember what has been noted by the Autism Science Foundation, and that is autism doesn't have a single cause. It's the result of a complex mix of genetics and environment. When it comes to the available data, we want to remind you that truly researching cause and effect relationships is incredibly challenging and yep. sometimes impossible, especially for relatively rare conditions. Right. But we do have a standard for this. It's called a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial in humans. These RCTs, as they're called, often take a lot of time, a lot of test patients, and a lot of money. And they rarely let you do them on pregnant women. Yes, almost never. Yes. So as for studying neurodevelopmental outcomes like ADHD and autism, that also can take eight to 10 years to diagnose. So RCTs are nearly impossible to do. Um, and so what we are left with is mostly population studies or case control studies that have many weaknesses, including relying heavily on observations, recall, um, and are at risk for being confounded by other outside factors. Yeah. 
And these other various kinds of studies can still offer beneficial insights. Totally. Um, but we have to remember their limitations. They're looking at associations, not causation. Indeed. The rate of people eating cheese may also be rising at the same rate of That's autism. Great, but yeah. just because two variables are changing at the same rates does not mean that these two things are related and certainly does not mean that how much cheese people are eating is causing autism. Indeed. Well done studies try to control for outside variables, but one of the first things we learn when learning how to evaluate research is that correlation does not equal causation. So let's get to the data. Yes, so let's start with the largest study to date. In 2024, a sibling study out of Sweden looked at 2.5 million kids born between 1995 and 2021. They compared siblings where one baby was exposed to Tylenol in utero and the other wasn't. Yeah, now this design is powerful because mm -hmm. it controls for genetics, environment to a degree, yep. and to family background. Um, what did they find? They found no increased risk of autism, ADHD, or intellectual disability. Correct. So that is pretty reassuring. However, it is not the whole story. Um, this study is one of the best we have, but it also has some limitations. Um, first, a sibling match study doesn't perfectly rule out all confounding factors. And as you look at the data in that particular study, they use the results of midwife surveys when the pregnant patients were seeing their midwife. Um, and the recorded rates of Tylenol use was as low as 7.5% when other similar studies in Sweden around the same time reported Tylenol use in pregnancy between 55 and 65%. Mm -hmm. So in other words, this study out of Sweden is good, but doesn't completely close the chapter on this question. Yeah, the rate of Tylenol use in that group of people makes you question like, oh, did they capture all the Tylenol use? Or maybe there was unreported Tylenol right. use in the group of people who had children that were unaffected. Yeah, so, um, But a lot of the news recently comes from a paper that was just published last month in August of 2025. Yep. Um, a group from Mount Sinai published a study. Um, they reviewed 46 other studies covering 100,000 participants Mm -hmm. through a unique methodology called a navigation guide methodology, which yeah. is a specific transparent framework yes. designed for specifically environmental observational studies. Yes. Now, the challenge here, as we've already discussed in researching topics like autism, is that the analysis, analysis here is largely observational. Right. So it's looking at relationships and associations and is not able to say that one thing caused the other. Now, but based on the unique framework used in this study, however, the study concluded that there was strong evidence of an association between prenatal Tylenol exposure, so exposure to Tylenol, acetaminophen, and paracetamol, and conditions like ADHD or autism. But, big but here, one of the issues was they lumped autism, ADHD, and intellectual disability and these other diagnoses together, which kind of makes the results harder to interpret. When it comes to the actual studies that this new paper looked at, kind of the too long don't read part of their abstract comments that they looked at 46 studies. Um, and of those, 27 of the 46 reported a positive association between yep. using Tylenol mm -hmm. and having some neurodevelopmental disorder, autism, ADHD. Yep. Nine of those 46 had no association and mm -hmm. four actually said that, hey, if you use those, you were less likely to have those disorders. Protective. Okay, mm -hmm. so, but, Again, the other specific diagnoses, if they look just at... Right, when you really break it down. Yes, um, there were only eight studies that looked at autism, of which five reported positive association and two showed no association and one had mixed results. Yeah. ADHD, there were more studies they looked at. There were 20 with 14 showing a positive association, three with no association and one with mixed or inverse reports. Um, and then those other neurodevelopmental disorders, 18 of the studies showed that, six showed positive association, four had inverse association and two showed no association. Yes, but certainly strong to say 27 showed a positive association with autism when really the, the there were eight studies that looked at autism, awesome. right? Yeah. So just, again, you've got to really look at all the data here. So why is the data not clear? Why do some studies say there's an association, some say no? And a lot of this comes down to what we call confounders. Maybe it's something like indication bias, where it's not the Tylenol, but the reason you're using the Tylenol. Is it the fever or an infection that could be the contributing factor? Sure, and, and 
So this is kind of why science looks messy because it is a little messy and different study designs answer slightly different questions and none are perfect. Um, it's actually been estimated in different studies that greater than 60% of women use Tylenol during pregnancy for headaches or other pain or fever with about 20% of pregnant women using Tylenol for more than 20 days. Um, there is some data that shows that increasing duration of exposure though was associated with tobacco use, obesity, self-reported depression or anxiety, um, and antidepressant use. So it makes sense that as we look at the Tylenol data that maybe one of these indications for using Tylenol could be playing a factor too. Yeah, is it something else? The reason they're taking the Tylenol that's playing a factor? Right, right. Maybe. Now, some of the studies actually cited in this paper from Mount Sinai tried to control that indication bias, mm -hmm. but still that factor cannot be completely removed and the data remains a bit messy to say the least. Indeed. With all of that then, what are the experts in the world of OBGYN saying about Tylenol use in pregnancy? So the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine or SMFM, this is high risk OBGYNs. They put out a statement that acknowledges that the data is inconclusive. They said studies don't prove a link, but also can't completely rule out the fact that there may be a connection. Yeah, and the college, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, ACOG, agrees. Tylenol remains the safest pain reliever in pregnancy. They recommend using the lowest effective dose for the shortest needed time. Which honestly is the advice we give for any medication during pregnancy. Yeah, and if you wanted to hear more from the authors of that Mount Sinai paper published last month, they also say, yeah. quote, what we recommend is judicious use, the lowest effective dose for the shortest duration of time under medical guidance and supervision tailored to the individual. So even the, the authors of the study that found this potential link said, hey, still reasonable to take Tylenol. Potentially with guidance with your physician, yep. trying to limit how much you're taking if you can. Yes. So there's some evidence about this too, as some studies have looked at the duration and dosing of Tylenol playing a role um, mm. with two studies, one from 2020 and one from 2023, that showed a higher risk of autism spectrum disorders with longer exposures to Tylenol. Yeah. So what are the risks of fever in pregnancy? Well, especially in the first trimester, a fever hyperthermia can be associated with a two to three times risk of neural tube defects. This mm -hmm. is spina bifida and encephaly. Sure. There's also increased risk of congenital heart defects or cleft palate, um, oral facial defects. And there's an increased risk of miscarriage. Yeah. So not treating a fever certainly also has some risks. In the second and third trimester, um, fever, especially from an intrauterine infection like chorioamnionitis, can trigger contractions and potentially preterm delivery. Um, and there's also thought that maternal hyperthermia associated with inflammation is potentially can increase the risk of adverse neurodeve neurodevelopmental outcomes as well, including cerebral palsy. Yeah, and so then the question is, what are you treating with this? What are you doing? What medications are you gonna use? Because if you weren't pregnant, you might think about, what about ibuprofen? What about Motrin? What about Aleve or Naproxen? Well, those NSAIDs can be potentially dangerous to baby, especially for their developing kidney. Um, if you give them a late in pregnancy, it can be really harmful to the heart. And so this is where Tylenol remains much safer than those other alternatives totally. because it doesn't have those big risks of the other NSAIDs, Motrin, Ibuprofen, Aleve, Naproxen, Aspirin. Right. So then the question is, what are we actually doing for ourselves and our family with this data? Yeah, so this has just been a very interesting thing to think about. Kurt asked me, he said, did you take Tylenol when you were pregnant with Hank? Hank? I said, <laughs> I don't remember. I really don't remember. I said, I think, I'm almost positive I took some when I was pregnant with Cease because I was studying for boards. And you had a lot of pelvic symphysis. Pelvic pubic. girdle pain. Yeah. Yep. And so I'm like, I think I did. This is just one of those things when I think about these studies that rely so much on observational data. I'm a, I think I'm a pretty good historian and you know, and have been very thoughtful during my pregnancies, but I tell you what, I 
I don't remember if I took Tylenol, how much I took, you know. Yeah. So it's just an interesting it's to think about. It's tough because all the data is kind of weak. And even, you know, there's so much desire to find what is causing autism. Of course. Like we want yeah. our kids to be healthy. We want our kids to be well. Um, yeah. And like, you know, it's interesting, you know, autism was diagnosed before Tylenol was on the market. Indeed. Right. And so like clearly Tylenol isn't the only thing at play here. Indeed. Maybe it's playing a role. Maybe, Maybe it's, it's part of this multiple hits in a series of hits Maybe that like could be sure. turning on the signals for this. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, it is the safest medication option we have for pain or fever in pregnancy. Yeah. And so if you need it, yeah. take it. Take it at the lowest dose that you need that works for you for the shortest amount of time you can. And don't stress if you've already taken it. It is one of the most commonly used med medicines in pregnancy worldwide. 65% of pregnant women have taken it. Autism rates are not there, right? So many people take this medication. It is not a one-to-one -one correlation. Yep. And if you're thinking about, is it safe to use in my children after birth? Absolutely. This is, again, one of the most commonly used medicines in infants. Um, we use it all the time for fever, for pain. works very well for these things. And there are not associations with neurodevelopmental outcomes with Tylenol use. Now, I'll say that's also hard to study, but we just don't have any evidence to suggest that that's playing a role in dosing after birth. Yep. And so the flip side, if you find yourself needing to take Tylenol day after day, because you don't feel well, you have a lot of pain, you have other things going on, that is absolutely a reason to talk to your OBGYN or your physician or midwife about what's going on because we want you to feel better and figure out what is going on there. Yeah, there may be some alternatives, things you can use, things that they can help you with, but also right. if you're at risk. Right, you've got a fever of 103, I tell you, every OBGYN out there is gonna say, hey, take some Tylenol, bring that fever down you're going to be feeling like garbage. Yeah. Um, so for us, we're weighing these risks and benefits for ourselves. Like mm -hmm. if you were pregnant, if it was the first trimester, and I would and take a fever. Tylenol for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would, I wouldn't take it every day, four times a day, yeah. but like I would absolutely, if I had a fever of 103, take it. Yeah. Yeah. For people with chronic pain conditions, this is a totally different conversation and things to consider. Yep. Um, but again, remember autism is not caused by one single factor. Correct. Like we said, maybe Tylenol is one hit in a series of things, including genetics, totally. infection, inflammation, other environmental causes. Maybe, yes. absolutely. Do yes. we know that for sure that it's playing a role? Sure no, does. but for now it appears that genetics plays the biggest role along with these other environmental factors that we can't always control. So we're gonna keep looking. That's what science does. We want to make lives better. Um, yeah, and hopefully this is kind of a, a really good insight for anyone who isn't familiar with the research process of like, hey, the, a lot of our data in medicine is a little messy. It is. Um, everything has to come with a grain of salt. And we take all the best things that we know from all of the data available to say, here's how we apply it in our real lives for the lives of our patients, et cetera. So yeah. anyway, um, if you like this, hopefully it was helpful. Like, subscribe, we'll see you guys. Uh, next week. We're doctors. But not your doctors. Anything we've said in this video is for education or entertainment purposes only. It is not medical advice. Any specific medical questions you have should be directed to your provider.